Hi, Wayne Dorban here for the bi-weekly NTP Seed webinar huddle that we hold here at our Northern Colorado headquarters in Loveland, Colorado, both live here at our site and also going out over the web to those of you that are watching. Enjoy what we have for you today. Our esteemed guest, Bob Christador, my friend and business partner with us here today. And we're going to just have some fun as we're going to do a interview with Bob, and he actually told me as we were prepping for this that he might turn the tables and actually interview me, so um, that, that, that'll be fun if we were to do that a little bit. Um, he's got some graphics, some fun things that Leanne's going to put up for us to look at, and again, this is just something for where we reach out to you, we hopefully give you some useful information, uh, teach you about um, us a little bit, in this case teach you a little bit about Bob, and and he's going to have some things that, that I think you're going to gain from his business experience and just some probably tips that he gives and just things from his life. We'd like you to just take those in. The whole goal is for us to, to work with you. For those of you that are online, kind of interestingly, I'm sitting in the front of a uh, conference room, which if you actually look at our video that we did two weeks ago, you'll actually see the table that we have in which people are sitting at, and they're actually looking up above me so up above me here is a big screen where um, Bob's being shown and, and any of the graphics that they're going to be seeing is Bob's looking up too, I see. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so that's where, where the people in the room are seeing things, and obviously Leanne is, is kind of clicking through graphics for you guys to see. So I'll just throw this out, start, and we'll do it again at the end. And Bob's focusing himself a little more. That, that's actually a good angle, Bob. Um, you see your good side. Uh, and uh, anyway, um, we'll be doing this again not in two weeks. Isn't that right, Leanne? Is this, this is our time where I believe we have – no, no, we do have two weeks this time. Josh is shaking his head at me in the room. I think it's after the next one that we actually have a three-week because the, there's a three-week time frame. Or a, it's either this next time or sometime in August. But anyway, first and third Wednesdays of the month, we do this live. And I'll say this, if you, if you want to – uh, you always can get the replay also, and you can find these on our uh, different sites. So Nurse the Planet, you'll see the site right below my name uh, on the screen here. Um, we also put it on several others of our websites. You can watch the replay there and um, you know just watch it at your leisure. But what we'd like you to do today is if you could interact with us. So ask us some questions, and um, we've got chat screens. You've got them on your screen also. Those of you in the room can just raise your hands or, or shout out or whatever, we'll acknowledge you. And um, like I said, we're going to have some fun. So uh, Bob, welcome to the webinar huddle. We call this our bi-weekly huddle. How are you doing today? I'm great and it's always an opportunity and a privilege to be able to speak with you. You're such a busy guy and always want to spend more and more time with you. Well, thank you. And I same to me. Bob and I actually have scheduled calls. Monday and Friday, but unfortunately, we probably end up missing half of them, and sometimes even more, because we are busy doing all kinds of things. So, and we missed Monday, so we didn't didn't get to chat this Monday. And and I am available Friday, Bob. I don't know whether you are, but even though it's the holiday, we could certainly make our call Friday. So, a little you know, bit. even though it is the holiday, I'll make myself available for you. All right. All right. So we sent some Bob, Bob some questions, like we do all the time when we when we're going to have someone. We don't want to ambush people with questions. So I've got a whole list of things to kind of throw out at him. And as I tell everybody before, we, we will be done in an hour or less. Uh, we're very respectful of both Bob's time and everybody else's. So, um, you know, I, 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 we start out by just tell us a little bit about yourself and your current business and life situation, just, just generally. So today is an interesting time in my life. I'm uh, not a young man anymore, as you uh, can plainly see. And I'm reinventing myself, as a lot of people are, um, our age are, because what happened over the last eight or nine years with our change in the economy and our age in business um, and the way business is conducted today, um, we have to find new ways of, of operating. And so I have a investment business, which is related to real estate, 
And um, anybody that's interested in finding out more about it, the website is note, N-O-T-E, peer, with the number two, peer, peer to peer com. And like you do this webinar, we do one every Tuesday and Thursday night. I'm sorry, second and fourth Thursday at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Mountain, for those of you who are in Colorado. Um, and we talk about real estate and real estate investing. And so that's one of my activities in life. But that's something that I do because um, I need to do that in order to live and pay all my bills and it's something that I have interest in but my passion really is in helping people that have been affected by this economy and the real estate part of it I'm trying to help people get to be able to buy a home again at the low prices because everybody's prices are a lot lower in, and particularly those people that can't get a, a loan anymore because their um, income has been affected, their job situation has been affected, uh, they've been gone through bankruptcy or had a foreclosure, all of which I've done by the way so I'm talking from first-hand experience. So I'm interested in trying to help those people recover because I feel fortunate that I'm very healthy and I want to be able to help people focus on staying healthy so they have the energy it takes to be able to recover their wealth. And so that's where my passion lies. And you and I share that interest, and that's one of the reasons why we're such great friends. By the way, I don't think I had a specific question about this, but because you mentioned it and you talked about healthy, and tell, tell the folks where you're at as we're interviewing you. and, and just broadly, your, your home area, and then even a little more specifically, just where your residence is in relationship to something else that I know is a passion of yours. <laughs> okay, well, um, I today live in Tucson, Arizona, and for my predominant uh, business career, I lived in San Francisco Bay Area, and I was in the insurance business, basically um, creating consulting relationships with mid-level size employers in the Bay Area. Now the Bay Area is unique in some respects and one of the uniquenesses of it is it has a plethora of companies that have a thousand to ten thousand employees and that was kind of the niche that we worked in. Um, but with the advent of healthcare and regulation it became a different business than I was interested in being in and, and I I left that business and as a result of doing that and went back into and I went into real estate at that time I started traveling from the Bay Area to Tucson Arizona and um, over the years I became more and more attracted to living in the heat rather than the cold and rain of Marin County and needless to say the price differential you know basically drop a zero uh, off of the cost of living in California when you move to Tucson so if any of you are looking for a really great place to live and you don't mind three months where it's over 100 degrees every day you can't go wrong with uh, Tucson um, anyway I live on a golf course uh, called Omni Tucson National and um, I'm literally I'm 50 yards from the ninth tee right as we sit here and so my passion around golf has waned a bit over the years, not to uh, use your name in my description, but I'm not quite as passionate about it anymore as I once was, largely because I'm not quite the player I once was, and so my enjoyment was in being really good at it. Now I just am moderately good. I think they're actually showing, yeah, she's got up now. That, that view that I think everybody's seeing is right out his patio door. Oh. That is about what five feet or ten feet to your uh, yeah the door is four feet from where I'm sitting and the end of the patio is another 25 feet right yeah um, so you're in your office there and I'll just throw out another one real quick I believe that's your mom and dad um, or your mom yeah. in the picture right behind you yeah there's uh, two pictures of them one you know, probably sometime in the 60s, the top picture. I'm not sure what you can see. And then uh, the, another picture of them at their 50th anniversary. We, I threw a big party for them in Florida, of all places, and 
the bottom picture was same day, same event, but with the rest of the family, my sister and my then wife and my son. And um, un unfortunately, but she did live a nice long life. Your mom died not too long ago, I know. But, but what was really cool is Bob actually took advantage of this same technology we're using and did a memorial service with her for her. So give, give the group just a little glimpse of that because it was very cool how you did that and, and what you did. Well, the, the challenge that I had was that I live in Tucson. Uh, no one else in my family lives here. We have family in New Jersey, we have family in Florida, we have family in California, spread all over the state of California, and friends in various and sundry places as well. Trying to put on an event to celebrate her life had all kinds of logistical challenges, and so because we have been experimenting with Google Hangouts, it occurred to me that it would be really simple to do something such as we're doing right now and spare everybody the need to be able to travel and the expense of it as well, plus be able to memorialize it all and put it on Google Hangouts or uh, YouTube for posterity. And despite giving everybody ample notice, there still were some people who couldn't even show up for that, although they were able to watch the replay later on. And we had a few technical difficulties, and I'm still challenged with Google Hangouts. You seem to have a much better Hangout um, hang handle on it, much to uh, the credit of Leanne. I wish she were here in Tucson because I use it more often. Um, and so anyway, we did do it. It worked out fairly well. And uh, there are certain things that I know now today had I known then, we could have made it better, but uh, be as it may, it, it, it turned out just fine. And you actually had, I know, a number of folks who were your mom's age. Your mom was, I think, around 90, right? Close to that. She died in uh, 94. She was halfway to 95. Right. And she had her peers, and they were, there were some of them were quite astounded of the technology, right? I think you had a couple stories. Well, those people needed to have a younger person, you know, kind of, clue them into what was going on. Some of them just visited by telephone. So we kind of coordinated Google Hangouts with uh, Uber Conference so that people could be on the telephone as well as be on the Google Hangout. And more people were on the telephone than on the Hangout. And, and again, Bob, because this is what we hope our audience gets, you just mentioned something else that I'll let you tell a little bit about. Um, so Hangouts, that's what we're using as a tool here. But you mentioned something else, Uber Conference. Tell Tell the group what that is and how does that relate to uh, videoing and so on. Well, generally speaking, the challenge with Google Hangouts is that you can't call on somebody to be able to visit. You have to set it up ahead of time for them to be able to join into the conversation. And so by connecting Uber Conference, which is a conference call in line, people can we, we could do the audio on an Uber Conference and the video on the Google Hangout, those two connect to one another. And that way you can have anybody who's on the conference call actually join in and talk live with us if that were what we were doing here today. So it overcomes the limitation of Google Hangouts by connecting Uber Conference. And when we use it in our business calls with our team members, we do do that today. And you can also record just the audio alone, right, Bob? And you can record, yeah. obviously, the video on YouTube and as we're doing with the Google Hangouts. So. Right, right, exactly. And Uber is just like it sounds, right? U-B-E-R. So. U-B-E-R, Uber, uberconference.com. Right. Um, another question that wasn't on the list, but it's, it's literally sitting and looking at everybody with uh, the, the avatar by your name on the lower third. Um, you've had a, at least a, a, a stint of a radio show. So... Uh, Tell us a little bit about that, and, and that the picture shows you, you know, with in front of the microphone and uh, right. doing your radio shows. Well, a couple of years ago, um, I was interested in one specific piece of the real estate market, and that piece was reaching out to people. This is 2012. We were still in the midst of the recession, I guess, in in Tucson, we still are, and I'm not sure uh, there's many other places that were as hard as hit as Tucson was. 
um, in any event, I was trying to reach out to the 75% of the people who were facing a foreclosure because they couldn't make their payments, and 75% of people could get in that situation virtually do nothing. They're like the deer in the headlights, and they uh, they do nothing. So we were trying to figure out a way to reach out to those people. So without getting into a long and song and dance on it, we decided that we would do a weekly radio show on a local Tucson station. Um, and we thought we had a good idea. And it was called the Real Estate Go-To Guys. And it's still out. Our, our shows are still available, audio only, um, out on the Internet. So if you, really, if you Google Real Estate Go-To Guys, you'll be able to find them. Um, and the, the goal was really to teach people about real estate, um, to answer their questions, get people to call in. And our, the good news, bad news situation for us was we did it for about six months. It got to be fairly expensive, and it didn't really have the effect that we were hoping for. Um, and the real... The real issue here is that we weren't getting people to acknowledge us because we were on the sports station. So mm -hmm. I thought, being a sports fan, I know we're going to get on right before people go to listen to the football game. Won't be that a great idea. And we got people calling up saying, when the hell does the game start? So we weren't on the right place. Uh, one of the guys that we started the uh, uh, program with realized what was going on and he then later on moved his the show and he did his own show uh, on the talk show station you know Rush Limbaugh and all the people that are on talk radio and he's having a lot of success now he was also a realtor so for him it had much more value than it did for me because I was trying to you know really reach out to a very small uh, segment of the population and I just thought that Tucson was a little bit too limiting for us that was kind of the evolution because at, in the middle of us doing that, we did this from uh, September 2012 to the early part of March, I guess, of 2013. In the middle of that, I got exposed to note and note investing and the note business, which basically is mortgages, which is what I was focused on before, but I was able to do it anywhere in the country. Um, and so that's what caused us to get into the webinar that we do every uh, twice a month, the Peer to Peer Mastermind webinar. So, so we just took it from on, on the air to offline and we still do it pretty much the same way as we did it then. So there's a couple of lessons there. One, a lot of times you can have a great idea and not be at the right time, and in your case, or the right place. So great idea, but wrong radio station. Um, and then also, um, you see something in business sometimes that you think is a, uh, a defeat, and yet it turns into uh, something else that can become something that can be a victory. So you just said that this radio station was one of the reasons, or the radio show, that led into your peer-to-peer webinar. -peer, um, well, I'm a firm believer in trying things and then adjusting if it doesn't quite work. And execution is kind of my watchword, and you and I have had many conversations about execution and that's the thing that separates people who have great ideas from people who are very successful and so it's part of the process try and then change as things need to adjust if you're not getting the results you want you have to try something different so nice. that's what we're doing and we keep doing it and you know as time goes on and the world changes around you, which is really the critical issue that we're all dealing with today. The world is never the same, even two days in a row. Well, <laughs> and so if you're not capable of adjusting, and unfortunately for many of our peers, it's hard for them to adjust today, um, it becomes difficult to stay on top of it. And as, our, as we've seen our parents' age, you, you can see how much more difficult it became for them as the world just is going way too fast for them. So my goal is to help people who are struggling to be able to stay on top of at least some aspect that's successful for them and in the process of doing that keep myself as sharp as I can possibly be. So I'm using my brain matter and I'm going to continue to use it as long as I can uh, and expect to be able to stay on top of things, which is part of the reason why my 
golf um, uh, interest has waned a little bit because my brain still works, my body doesn't. Right. Well, let me ask you some of these other questions that I'd thrown out to you. So, um, tell us where you grew up. So it's a two-part question, sort of where in the country, and I think you said a little bit about that, but where you grew up, and what was one event from your youth that you remember that um, has really caused you to pursue the current path that you've just been talking about? So helping people and helping peers and such. So where did you grow up, and, and think of an event that might have uh, impacted what you're doing today, and tell us about it. So did you listen to any of the audio answers that I gave to Leah? Uh, no, and I told her my stock answer for anyone that asked me where I grew up, and the answer is I haven't yet. Ah, okay, that's a good. So one. I'm kind of Peter Pan in that respect, and that uh, I don't ever want to grow up, and uh, I like youthful people that are nimble brains and keep me stimulated. Uh, but I spent my formative years in New Jersey, and then moved to Ohio to, for college, and then kept going west most of my. I lived in San Francisco in Marin County, just north over the Golden Gate Bridge, for 30 years of, you know, more than half my life was there. So that one event, what, what's yeah, that? Yeah, that one's a tough one, you know. Uh, you're asking questions about... My youth was idyllic. Uh, I have a great extended family, and I, I have a sense of family. I have a sense of... Italian background, um, so, and I was always the consigliere, so if you watched anybody who watched The Godfather and who hasn't, you know, I, I was the consigliere and, you know, I, I, was, I was Michael and I guess now I've become the Don because my, my parents have passed on. Um, and so because of that background, and I was always the go-to guy back to the real estate, uh, of helping people. And so I just have this sense of being um, blessed with background and ability and knowledge. I mean, I've, you know, I've, I've gone through every level of education, including a law degree, even though I've never practiced law but for a few weeks because I hated it. Um, so I've got great education. I've got a great family. Um, I've had great experiences, I've had great success, and as a result of that, I feel like I owe it to the world to be able to use that so that I can help other people, and if there's a legacy that I want to leave behind, it is being able to say, you know, I did something that is not just for me. So, I don't know if that's a specific answer to your question, but that's the best I can give you under the circumstances. Actually, I think you can give me a better one. Um, so, I'm going to probe a little bit here. One one thing. So you're. I don't care what age you are. You're 16, 17, 18. You're acting as a consigliere, and as you described, that's a great description. Just something that hits you that you remember doing that sort of was in that role. A little more specific than this to just the general. And if there's not, just say that. But if just think for a second, if there's something that you know related to. All right. So I'm going to do two things. Number one, I'm going to defer to the answer to that question. Okay. And number two, I'm going to now turn the tables on you. Yes. Okay. So, Mike, I have a question for you, which is, what's the purpose of this, and why did you want me to be on? The purpose is to primarily help our live pe live group here that are um, mostly young, um, although sometimes we'll have some older folks here, and all those also out on the internet and that are going to watch this as a replay, sort of learn about life and, and, and be able to learn about how they might improve their own lives and then improve the planet, which is also a big goal for us. Um, and so that's the purpose. And so why you? Well, I, um, one, um, you're a friend, you're a business partner, and I think it's nice and insightful for those that are around me here locally and on the internet and such to know, okay, what are the kinds of people that you would do business with and that you, that are friends of yours? And then second, um, I just think you've got an incredible amount of life experience that could be of benefit and value. So, yeah, that's the purpose and why you, those reasons. And I think you've got an interesting story. So. Okay. All right, so let me answer your question with this. Um, the life experience that I think um, has made me 
really motivated me throughout my life is really understanding what it takes for an individual, and I'm using my dad as the perfect example, of someone who limited education, grew up in a time, you know, during the, he, he matured during the Depression, and it was always motivated by the fact, or, and protective, very protective, because he'd lived through the Depression. And I never understood it, but he was very successful at what he did. And what I saw that he did was he was in the advertising business and he um, got paid kind of ongoing commissions as an independent contractor. He never actually was an employee of the company. So he was an independent businessman. And I became attracted to the insurance business for one reason, and it was residual income. And I left the insurance business years and years later, having done very well, and then I sold the company off. And in the process of selling the company off, I sold my residual income. Now, I won't say that I'm kicking myself all the way to the barn, but in many respects, I'm looking for the next answer to create the residual income because that is the life force that will be able to sustain me and anyone else, particularly in as an advancing age. If you don't have that and you're trading time for money, it is going to be a very long and difficult struggle, particularly when you're dealing with an environment that we have today where jobs are difficult to find that have a really sustainable lifestyle that come with them. So I think the young crowd that you're appealing to right now is probably experiencing it even more than the baby boomers that I represent because those people never had a chance to accumulate anything in their life, either experiential or asset-based. And so now they're struggling trying to find a, a, a place in life having grown up with get an education, get a job. They got an education and what they got is a bill and no job that comes along with it. So I think that we have two markets that we can help. One is the baby boomers who have been displaced by this um, change in our economy and the younger people who need to be able to think entrepreneurial rather than employee. And if there, anybody has not read this book, it's Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and it's really about real estate investors, but it's really more about the psychology of where you fit in life. And he talks about the big E and the little E and a lot of other things I'm not going to get into right now. But I would certainly recommend to anyone that if you haven't read that book, you should do it. Real estate becomes part of it, but that's not the real message there. And if you haven't read Think and Grow Rich, that's my Bible. I'll stick to it until the day I die. And even though it was written almost 100 years ago, it still has viability today. Super. I'm going to turn the table. answer to that question. Oh, that was great. No, it was awesome. And I'm going to turn the tables to our live audience here real quick and ask two questions. One, have, you, have any of you read either of those two books, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, or, um, or Think and Grow Rich? Highly recommend it. And I will tell you, at least as it relates to the last one, Think and Grow Rich, I guarantee you that if you just go out and look around on the internet or even if you talk to some of your friends, there will be people that will have read Think and Grow Rich and you will think that it was written yesterday because of the way they describe it and it wasn't. That book was written um, I think in the late 1800s, correct Bob? Maybe maybe early 1900s, but yes. Napoleon Hill was... Yeah, I think it was bef you know the 1920s I think. Yeah, it was, it was in a, a long time ago, but it's, it's relevant today or more relevant than it was then. Second question for the audience. What, do you know what Bob means when he's talking about residual income? One person shaking their head yes. Is that like income on the side? Uh, no. I mean, that, it could be. I mean, that, that's a yes and no answer. It, it absolutely could be on the side, but that's not really the definition. So. I'm not seeing Eric to know whether he's shaking his head yes uh, or no. When uh, you kind of develop a constant income, but you're not, you like set the, like the snowball rolling, but it like kind of does something. 
You're, you're getting closer. You're getting closer. No, I? Yeah, I was going to say it just kind of on its own um, appreciates. Okay. In a way. Probably the simplest definition, I'll give mine, Bob, you give yours, because they're probably a little different, is income that is coming in without any of your current effort. You do not have to be doing anything to have it come in the door. That's sort of residual. Now, that doesn't mean you didn't ever do anything to have it. <laughs> you are going to have to work for some period of time to get it to be at that point. But when it becomes residual, it means that it's coming and you don't have to do anything for it to come in. So it could be on the side, Joe, you know, as you said. But the reality, and it usually does start out on the side. But in the long term, um, you know, you, if at all possible, you want it to be there, full, uh, you know, in, in its entirety. And frankly, that's what most people think about as retirement. So Social Security, well, great residual. You, you work for 45 years um, and, and, and have a residual. And there is a residual. Right now there is. I don't know whether there will be when you guys reach retirement age, but there is still now. But it's what, you know, barely enough to be on the poverty level with um, by, by that residual. And you worked way too many years to get there. Bob, give your definition because it might be a little bit. Well, I, I prefer to give you a, an example rather than a definition. Um, but residual income is when you do something once and then you get paid forever. So a good example would be if you purchased a, a life insurance policy from me and you paid premiums on that insurance policy for 40 years, I'd get a commission for 40 years even though you only, I only made one sale. So that's a classic example of residual income. Now I don't get the same commission every year for 40 years, but if you have 40 years worth of residual incomes adding up because you did it for 40 years, you have a lifetime's worth of income. Um, and today it's easier to be able to create residual income if you work at it for a good period of time. So your example with your Amway business, I'm sure everyone there has heard that before and if not you ought to share it with them um, and you know what you did, when you did it and how much you're still getting paid residually having done nothing for a number of years. Yeah, I, I probably shared that with most of the people here live but I mean, a simple, simple story, really. I worked for, I worked part time, Joe, on the side, four or five years, to, and and ended that five years. So from 1985 to 1990. So for the last 24 years, I've worked not at all. And interestingly, Josh isn't even aware of this source of income because it comes in separately. Josh is the CFO here, but um, I've had a residual income from that business for over a 24-year period that has never been less than 400 a month. And there were, in the early stages of after that, that five-year period, it was, you know, an order of magnitude higher, 5,000 a month or such for a period of years. So if you add the number up over now 24 years, it's, it's you know, uh, seven figures probably. Um, and... And it, and it would say then that if, if you look at what did I really earn over that five years of working on the side, it was, um, you know, a lot more than I was probably were earning for what I was doing full time during that time. So that, that's truly a residual, and just like Bob's example. Although, interestingly, I don't think very many insurance um, commission schedules today would do what you're describing. That, that was the case, meaning they, they won't pay you forever on a, on a, on a long term. Mm -hmm annuity or something. They, they'll terminate it at some point. <laughs> That's true. So the business I was in, um, which was the health insurance business, and we basically did consulting. And so the residual income wasn't residual in the, in the sense that once a year we'd have to sit down and re you know, remanage that customer, but then we got paid for 12 months. And so that was a continuing process. And over the years, it built up to several million dollars in you know, annualized revenues that we were able to accumulate myself and three partners and we had 25 employees and, uh, you know, it got to be a fairly big business and we sold that off uh, to one of the largest insurance brokers in the country and uh, I got out of the business at that point in time and uh, haven't gotten a steady paycheck since. 
So here's a question that I always love asking because it really will tell people a little bit about you. So you take yourself back in time. You were fifth, when you were 15 years old in New Jersey, and it was a beautiful Saturday afternoon. What would Bob be doing? Give us a glimpse of, of yourself at that time. Well, uh, it's a great question. I'm not so sure it's going to be all that meaningful to anybody to hear this, but I mean, I um, was I, I was into golf early on. I didn't really play at that point in my life, and what I did do was caddy. And so, for those of you who are not familiar with golf, there's a big golf bag with 14 clubs in it. And back in the day when I was 15. Those bags were made out of leather, and they were fairly heavy. And there was a kind of an exclusive. There were, you know, back east. Now this is New Jersey, northeastern New Jersey, not far from New York. Um, today, then, and as to today, as well as then, a lot of prestigious, exclusive golf clubs that members uh, can join. And so I caddy that Ridgewood Country Club, which is in Paramus, New Jersey, and as it turned out, it was one of the was designed by A. W. Tillinghast, which would I doubt that's up there. If she found that one, she's she's really good. Yeah, she did. I can't see the screen because I don't have my glasses on, so you have to tell me what the screen shows. It's, it's an overhead, so it's an aerial. Um, okay. So anyway, Ridgewood Country Club is a was a I don't know five to eight mile away from the house, and back then you could hitchhike. Back and forth without worrying about you know being abducted, um, and so my parents let me hitchhike back and forth. And every every weekend, Saturday and Sunday, I would hitchhike over to the golf course and get a loop and make twenty dollars, uh, which was you know decent money. And I'd use it to go buy food with. <laughs> I was saving for college, is what I was doing. So I, I probably got uh, ten dollars a month that I got to save out of that. <laughs> Bob used one jargon there that we'll see if people know. He said, I'd, I'd get a loop. Anybody know? That? Uh, that's that's you know, you've seen Caddyshack, right? That's what a looper is. You know, somebody that's gonna that's playing around the golf, a loop. And so it was gonna somebody that was gonna be playing needed a caddy. So that's what he was that was what he was doing there. Um, you've already talked a little bit about this, but just to ask it again in a little different way. Tell us about one person, and it could be anyone. You've mentioned your dad already, and it could be your dad that's, that, that influenced you in your youth um, that really had a major life experience, um, excuse me, a major impact on your life after college, let's say, so for all of your adult life, whether it's your dad or somebody else. I, I'm going to change the way I answer this question because he, clearly my dad was a big influence on me. Um, and the biggest influence in my life was not somebody that I would consider a mentor, but an anti-mentor. Now, what do I mean by that? So if you've seen people in your life and you see someone who's very successful and you say, God, if he can do that, imagine what I can do. And I had that person. Huh. I won't mention his name, but I was watching this guy and I'm going, he can't even chew and he can't chew gum and walk. How can he possibly be this successful? Well, he was a smart guy, but he had a, a Columbo-ish approach. Now, many people don't know who Columbo was, so um, I'll just give you a brief um, example. And, and Columbo was a detective on a TV program back in probably the 60s, and he came across as very unprepossessing. Um, and he put everybody at ease because they didn't think he knew what he was doing. But in fact, he was very sharp, and he used that to disarm everybody and get them to admit things. So this guy was Columbo to me. I watched what he did, and I'm saying, geez, I can really do well in this business, in these things, and I basically followed what he did and just did it better. Uh, and that's my evaluation of whether it was better. Other people may not agree with that. And uh, we, you know, we were fast friends uh, forever. And it was, I feel, um, 
like I missed out on something. Because most people, we talk about mentors today, people that have been a big influence on each individual's life, and they mentors sell themselves. Now you have to go buy a mentor. And most people that have had one that, you know, someone just put, took them under their wing, usually worked for a company, and they found somebody that they could identify with and they nurtured them along so they could be successful. I never had that. So my nurturing came from me nurturing myself to do something better than I was watching other people do what they were doing and continually look for new ways to do things better and better. We didn't have the internet. Uh, it was not easy to be able to find out how to do things better and we eventually, that individual, myself and several others, created our own mastermind. And that mastermind really developed into something very special when the Clinton administration did health care reform. I won't digress, but um, I feel like today it's easier to find someone that you can identify with and have that person influence your life. Sometimes you have to pay for it. And I'm not sure I'm a big advocate for that, but I'd rather pay for it than not have it. Awesome. Another bit of wisdom for everybody. Um, so um, I told you earlier, you, when you asked what the purpose of the, of the show was, and I said it was for our people here locally and others out on the net that um, they could benefit and gain personal benefit and also the planet gain some benefit. And so I'm going to ask you a question that, that I have no idea what your answer is to this, but what, what does the word sustainability mean to you? Well, I know the context that you use it in, and I wish that I had um, an answer that kind of fit your audience's need. Um, but to me, sustainability is more a place of empowerment for anyone to be able to self-generate interest, activity, energy, um, and income that feeds their family and allows them to live the lifestyle that they want to. It has nothing to do with food, although food is part of healthy living. And the only thing that I can talk about from a food standpoint really is our venture into uh, build, you know, using hydroponic uh, gardening in our home here in Arizona, which is only a six-week-old project. So right now we have green stuff coming out of it. And I'm hopeful that uh, the Tower Garden, there it is, yeah, the Tower Garden will actually start producing some tomatoes. Interestingly enough, we made some uh, bean tacos last night, and it was my job to chop up the tomatoes that were going into the mix that we made into the tacos. And as I was cutting them, I'm saying to myself, these don't even feel like tomatoes. I know they're not going to taste like tomatoes. So I can't wait for ours to actually produce something that I can eat right off the vine. It's been a long, long time, other than going to the farmer's market when I lived in San Diego, to be able to get something that, you know, came right from the garden and right into the to the house where it really tasted like a tomato. But I remember my grandparents used to grow them in their backyard, and my, the, my I was young, and I remember them all the relatives or the my aunts and uncles and my parents sitting out in the backyard pulling tomatoes off of the the vines and washing them and putting salt on them and just eating them like they're apples. Those days are gone. Well, no, they're not. You're going, to, you're going to do it yourself. Yeah, well, okay, those days are gone if, unless you do something like what you're doing. Right. Um, there's another piece of that, um, that food adventure that I know you've gone through uh, that I'd also like you to share, and, and I think there are people in our audience or that are aware of this. Uh, Bob has completed the Transform 30 program that, that um, Reagan and Dean came in and talked to um, a number of us about. And, and so, Bob, talk about a little bit about what that program involved for you. And by the way, it, it's one that can be different for everyone that does it. And then what do you see now? Because you're, you're at least a month um, after completing it, if not more. And um, how do you see that it's changed your, your both eating and, 
and just lifestyle habits? Well, first of all, let me say that it's a misnomer to say you complete it. You're transforming yourself, and in the process of transforming, at the other end, you are what you are. It's different than what you are were, and there's no completion. You just keep doing it. So I'll give you a little background. Um, so my girlfriend, um, my partner, um, is very health conscious, and by osmosis, I got a lot of that health consciousness along the way. Now, I've always had passion about being an athlete and golf, and so to me, I was always trying to do what I could to make myself capable of playing golf at the highest level that I could. So I used to run until I was 40. You still do. I don't know how you do it, but I, uh, I wish I could because there's nothing better uh, from an athletic standpoint. Uh, that high that I used to get from running that I don't get anymore uh, is something that I miss. Be that as it may, I, when I stopped running, even though I was relatively healthy, um, you know, I gained some weight over the last 40 years. And, uh, and then there's always those emotional problems that you deal with in life. We haven't really talked about, you know, the downsides that we've been through and we can share some of that later on but I went through some tough times and in the process of going through those tough times you tend to do things to satisfy your uh, you know your your immediate needs I guess they call it comfort food and uh, you know I was always and my things were all peas you know pizza popcorn pasta potatoes you know those kinds of things so I, I already knew what they were Long story short, over the last couple of years, after all of the real bad times were over, and she, by the way, had breast cancer that uh, we got, we caught early on, and um, so we were even more tuned into healthy eating, and we we did fairly well. So, fast forward to the end of April, and uh, I went up to see you in Phoenix, and you were at the Juice Plus convention talking to people about the Tower Garden and sustainability and I had no interest in Juice Plus, I didn't even know what it was. Um, but uh, there was so much passion around the product that I had to investigate a little bit and I came across this program which is entering the Juice Plus world at the highest level which is called Transform 30. So for us who really did almost everything that it required it required us to change what we ate very slightly. It also caused us to use um, the Juice Plus products that I had never used before. And the reason why I chose to do it is that I never liked vegetables. You and I share this one. You know, I don't like them. I'll eat salad. I love salad. You know, and I eat, you know I'll eat the potato and uh, tomatoes. I love tomatoes. But boy, when they're green, you know, I'm just not really into them. So I've learned to eat them because she loves them, and uh, that I, you know, she eats three quarters of them, I eat a quarter of them. So the Juice Plus concept is, you know, they've been able to get the products down to a way they put it in a capsule. And I said, you know, I know that it's something that will be beneficial. I need to do that. So I started doing the Transform 30 program, which included the capsules. And the most important thing was taking the protein shakes in the morning instead of having eggs and bread and all the things that we used to have. So the only things that I did as part of this Transform 30 program were one, eliminate sugar. And I knew that that was a problem that I had. Two, pretty much eliminate bread, which is another problem. To me, lunch was a sandwich. Breakfast was eggs and sometimes toast and dinner was even though I may have had something like tomatoes I'd have some bread with the tomatoes so I always was eating bread and there's a just as an aside there's a great place here in Tucson called Beyond Bread and I've never had better bread anywhere in even San Francisco this place is as good as San Francisco so I, and I used to 
when we were we just moved and we were living on one side of town and driving to the other, I was we were redoing it, and I'd have to go beyond bread twice a day. But I stopped at least once a day to go there. Anyway, so I eliminated sugar, eliminated bread, and what was the other thing? Oh, eliminated dairy. I cheat there a little bit. Okay. So those were the only changes that we made. You also um, ate multiple. I think you did one more. You ate multiple me more meals, smaller and more, correct? Okay. So no, this was an evolution. So the first month is when you're going through this transformation. And so morning we would have a protein shake. And then in the beginning we would have a protein shake for lunch too. So we were only eating one meal at the end of the day and that was primarily vegetarian. Um, which to me was difficult because to me meat was part of a meal and so no pasta and no meat was challenging so I mean we found these bean tacos and I love them and so <laughs> we have those at least once a week and uh, after a while you know we got into a routine of finding things that met all of the guidelines long story short I've been trying to lose weight for years I mean, I got to the point where I won't get into how, what the actual numbers were, but I was 20 pounds heavier than I am today. Even despite, and about two years ago, I knew I had to do something, and I just happened to be watching an interview, I forget who it was, but someone was interviewing Bob Hope, and they asked him how he stayed so trim, and he said, I walk an hour every day. I don't care where I am, what time of the day or night it is, or what I've done, I walk an hour a day. And I said to myself, I can do that. I can go walk an hour a day. So I started walking actually an hour and a half. I built up to the point where I walk about five miles a day. And I do it every day, but I do it probably about six days a week. So my goal is to walk 100 miles a month. Um, and I started doing that. Uh, so I lost some weight just from doing that, and I didn't change my eating habits all that much, although I think my portions started reducing because there was a connection between the exercise and the eating. But when I got on this Transform 30 program, I kept walking. We made those three little changes, and for the first time in years, there was a connection between eating and feeling full and I realized how long that delay was. The result of the understanding that delay caused me to eat less because I felt uncomfortable. And I remember when I used to run, the, it was automatic. I knew when I was full. And I would stop eating because I knew the next day I had to carry it with me and running for, you know, I used to run an hour in the morning every day. Um, and so that connection is slowly but surely reconnected with me. Um, and there were a lot of uh, little issues that I had to go through, um, but I had a couple of chronic issues that I was dealing with um, without getting into the details of what those were. I was hoping that I'd been trying vitamins, I'd been trying everything to see if I could mitigate those chronic issues, and this program did. So everything that I was feeling um, went away. So I'm not a you know, a, a classic person to say this is a life transforming issue for me because it didn't make a tremendous difference in my life because it was already pretty good. But I've seen other people that I've introduced to it who have been able to lose weight, you know, for the first time in their lives. I mean, I talked to one of my friends who at one time was over 300 pounds, had a heart attack and died, and they revived him. He lost a bunch of weight, got down to 185, and now he's back up to 260. I got him on the program, and in a week he lost 10 pounds. So he's become a big advocate for the program. So the bottom line here is that it's made us much more aware of what we eat and how we eat. Um, it's become a new way of eating, and it's not that big a difference from the way we used to eat before. And so, you know, we do have the occasional dessert, we do have the occasional piece of meat, you know, when we go out to eat, we'll cheat a little bit, but the uh, vast majority of the time, you know, we're pretty stick to it of this, and the protein bars and the protein shakes have been the revelation in the whole process, because you replace meals with those, and 
it's easy and convenient. Talk about it tastes good and it's convenient to do and it's fast to do. So people who are using fast food restaurants because it's convenient can do this. It's even more convenient and so much more healthy. I'm going to take a little break from asking you questions and ask the audience if they have any. And, and people can raise their hands in the room or, or online. Um, and I have just a couple more. And, um, if, and I'd like to ask now, Bob, what are, what are we doing together? Um, what are the things that we're up to together? And I think that every, all of your answers have been um, related to it. And so talk about Balanced Life Team a little bit and, and what we're doing together, but also in the room. Any questions? Think about that for a second. Anybody have any questions for Bob? So they're thinking. So why don't you answer the question, what, what kinds of things are we up to together? And then I only have one other question afterwards, this one for you. So, and we're about five minutes or so before we're going to end up. Okay. Well, that's a good question. I'm looking forward to having more time together so we can move it along because of that comment I made earlier about execution. But conceptually, we have a, um, a, a common interest in helping people. Yours is more from a nutritional standpoint, and that's where the Juice Plus stuff kind of fits in. Uh, mine tends to be maybe, and you have the same interest in helping people from a financial standpoint, but both of us are really interested in people's health and their ability to sustain themselves in both uh, economics, um, emotional, physical, and uh, financial terms. And so those are the four pillars that we're working on helping people through a set of tools that will allow them to find their way either uh, in, in all four of those areas so they can live a balanced life. And just as an aside, I think I've mentioned this to you before, um, there's a, a doctor, I think he's a PhD, he's not an MD, but he could be an MD, uh, here in Tucson, and he's a world-renowned um, nutritionist, and his name is Andrew Weil, W-E-I-L, and so I've been following him recently. I was hoping that we might be able to do some affiliate with him, and so far that hasn't quite worked out yet, but I'm sure as we gain some uh, foothold and notoriety that, uh, that we'll get their attention and be able to work with them. Um, but anyway, he sends out a, a, a newsletter called Balanced Living, and so uh, there's a, there's, you know, we're not the only people on the planet that are interested in helping people live a balanced and healthy life, I think the difference between us and everyone else is that they're selling them something and we're finding a way to give them the way to be able to create their life that they can follow that meets the goals and objectives that they have even though they may have given up hope because uh, the world has changed so much and they're not sure where they fit in it. And I think that's where we're unique in being able to develop a tool set that will allow people to find a um, their place in life again. Very cool. And again, that's Balanced Life Team, and the website you can go and look and see sort of a preview. We're just kicking it off. It's called balancedlifeteam.com, and there's a number of articles that um, talk about just different things you can do to help in all four of those areas, improve your financial lives, your spiritual lives, your mental lives and your and your physical lives. So I said the last question, and um, I've stolen this one from John Lee Dumas, who is one of the more famous podcast hosts out there. He has a show called Entrepreneur on Fire. Highly recommend it if you'd like to watch it or listen to it sometime, excuse me. And he does it every day, so it's a daily podcast. Um, and this is the question he asks, and I'm going to end this one with you, Bob, and that's this. It's essentially, if you woke up this morning and you realized I am not on Earth, but it, where I am is an awful lot like Earth. It appears everything is the same. Um, you have all your needs taken care of after you've sort of woke up and walked around. You see I'm, I'm not starving, and I'm in a house, and there's food and such. And you have a laptop and $500. What are you going to do over the next seven days? Well, online poker came to mind, but that's not the right answer. 
Um, to me, the, if you find yourself in a place that you're unfamiliar with, but you think it feels familiar, the best thing you can do is talk to the most influential people that you can connect with. And because of the way that we're connecting here today and the way you can connect with people from your home, from anywhere you happen to have an internet connection and a, and a laptop, um, you're able to do exactly what we're doing right now, and that's talk to people, find out what they've done, what kind of advice they can provide. Um, and the more often you can do that, the better you're going to find that you understand where you fit and also understand where the opportunities that kind of coincide with your interests lie. And there's nothing that I can suggest more to anyone, and that is really find out where you have an interest and that you would pursue that interest whether or not you got paid for doing it. And then eventually you'll find a way by pursuing it where that interest will open a door that will create a sustainable lifestyle for you. That means information. It means emotional support. It means financial support. The physical is going to be up to you. You're going to have to do that regardless of what you do. And I recommend to everyone you know, that you spend an hour a day doing something that's good for your body. And for me, I have to do it first thing in the morning because if I wait, I don't get to it. You're my <laughs> role model for somebody that can go out at 5 o'clock at night and do it every day, but uh, I can't. For me, if I don't do it at 5 o'clock in the morning, it doesn't get done, so that's kind of my own particular MO. So I'm hopeful that answered the question. Um, there's a lot of uh, really cool things that you can learn from people, and the best part about most people, especially people who are successful, if you ask them for their their opinion, they've got one, as you've heard me today. Awesome. Um, again, any questions from our audience, either online or uh, here in the room, for Bob? Well, you Bob, want me to have a question? <laughs> yeah, well, you did a great job. I'm going to summarize a little bit. And, um, Uber Conference, that's something you should think about. Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. Um, think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, two books you can read. Um, residual Income, if you're thinking about that. Um, balanced Life and, and the four pillars that Bob talked about, physical, emotional, mental, and financial. Um, persistence, and we didn't talk about some of the, the tougher times, Bob. That, we'll save that for another time, but um, you know, Bob has gone through some what a lot of people would consider incredibly tough things that they'd, they'd frankly quit um, and wouldn't continue, but, but he hasn't done that. And as he said, yeah, I think one thing really sticking to me, because uh, it took me a little bit by surprise, is I said, what did you you done when you have grown up? And he said, I, I haven't grown up. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm in the process of growing up. And so, Bob, thank you so much. And You're welcome. A, a, a round of applause. Bob, thank you. And um, we'll look forward to everybody coming back in two weeks on the, uh, what would that be, the 16th? And uh, here, same time, same place. And we will be with Glenn Myers. Glenn is the founder and uh, an author and CEO of a company called Green Build and several other um, green-related uh, um, living and building enterprises. I think you'll enjoy him a lot. And uh, Bob, again, thanks. And we'll talk to everybody again.